turn to Ephesians chapter 6, but before we look at it together, I want to ask you a question, and Lucy, I need you to move on the slides, because I think it's not working. If you want to be, so this is, this is a silhouette here of, uh, I think it's probably John, it's not really me, is it? This one? Okay, so if you want to be strong, what do you need to do? Ask the person next to you, what do you need to do if you want to be strong? Ask the person next to you, and then I will ask you. What do you need to do if you want to be strong? Okay. Now, Scarlett, you had an answer. Shout it, shout it out. You have to eat healthy. Put your hand up if you said eat healthy. Yes, well done. Um, so Lucy, if you skip two slides real quick, skip one slide and then, the, yeah, there you go. That's, so you, you don't wanna eat the burgers and the chips, right? But you wanna eat the, whatever, you wanna eat protein, don't you? I don't know what that is, but anyway, there you go. Eat healthy. What did anyone else say? What do you need to do? If you wanna be strong, what do you need to do? Jeremiah, you need to go to the gym. Yes, that's right. You need to go to the gym. Put your hand up if you said go to the gym. Yeah, quite a lot of you said go to the gym. Keep your hand up if you go to the gym. <laughs> Keep your hand up if you pay to go to the gym, but don't attend the gym. There you go. Right, there you go. Okay, it won't help you. Anything else that you need to do in order to be strong? In order to be strong. Oh, Jen. Rest. Yeah, that's right. You need some recovery time so that you can rest and allow your muscles to build. Right. If you put the next slide on, Lucy. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 11, tell us about being strong as a Christian, strong as a Christian. So let me read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11 to you. And I want you to think, what is it, if I want to be strong as a Christian, what is it that we need to do according to Ephesians 6, verses 10 and 11? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. What is it that you need to do in order to be strong as a Christian? What is it that you need to do to be strong as a Christian? Chat to the person next to you again and come up with an answer and I will ask you. Ask them, what is it that you need to do to be strong as a Christian? Okay. Does anybody have an answer? What is it that you need to do to be strong as a Christian? Jeremiah, put on, sorry, put on armor. That's right. That's what he says, isn't it? Put on the armor. But what is the armor? Who does the armor belong to? The armor belongs to God. Yes, yeah, someone over the back there said, said Jesus. Was that you, Kerry J? Hiding behind Lola's head. Yeah. Yeah, it belongs to the Lord, doesn't it? The armor belongs to the Lord. Listen, this is a bit mysterious, isn't it? But to be strong as a Christian, you need to get your strength from somewhere other than yourself. Yeah? You cannot go to the gym and get strong as a Christian. You need the strength to come to you from outside. You need the strength to come from the Lord himself. And that's exactly what he offers to do in the armor of God. And over the next, so this Sunday and next Sunday, we're gonna be looking together at the armor of God and what it means for us to be strong in the Lord. One last question, why does it matter? Why does it matter that you're strong as a Christian? Why does it matter? Have a look in the verse and answer the question, why does it matter? Speak to the person next to you again, why does it matter? Okay, I'm looking for someone different to answer this time. 
someone different. Who can tell me why it matters that we are strong as a Christian? Why does it matter? According to verse 11, why does it matter that we're strong as a Christian? Scarlett, you've done a really good job of answering. So I will come to you if nobody on this side of the room knows the answer, okay? Because this side has answered all the questions so far. Well, except for Jen. Okay, sorry, Jen. Don't mean to offend you. Why do we need to be strong as a Christian? What does verse 11 say? Avon. So you can stand against the devil's scheme. Scarlett, is that the right answer? Is that what you were going to say? Yes, brilliant. Yvonne, you're right. Scarlett says you're right. Absolutely. It says that, doesn't it? You need to stand against the devil's schemes. This is amazing, isn't it? The Bible tells us that if we're going to live the Christian life, if we're going to trust in Jesus, be sorry for our sins and live our lives for him, we need to be strong with his strength because we have an enemy, the devil, who has schemes to stop us trusting in Jesus. So that's why we need to be strong. Let me pray and ask for the Lord's help for you guys as you go to Sunday school, and then we'll, you guys can head off and we will read God's word and listen to it talk together. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we want to pray and ask that you would help us to be strong, but not in our own strength, but in the strength that you give us. We pray that we might do that because we know we live lives for you in a place that's a battle against the devil. So please give us strength, we pray. We ask for our children as they head to Sunday school, we pray that they might have a lot of fun and that they might learn a lot about you and that they may learn to trust you and live their lives for you. We pray for their leaders uh, that you would help them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Sunday school children, you guys can head out. The rest of you, if you're staying in, you might want a pen. Um, we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 13. So just four verses for us this morning, and Morteza is going to come and read those uh, verses for us. So, Morteza, I'm over to you. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take use your stand against the devil's schemes for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the powers of dark of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms <clears throat> therefore put on the full armor of god so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Amen. Thanks, Morteza. Let me just pray briefly again to ask for the Lord's help. Heavenly Father, just having heard those few words, we know now that we're in a spiritual battle to listen to you. Please help us, we pray. Give us concentration, we ask. More than just concentration with our minds, though, we pray that you might give us tender hearts that long to listen and obey. Pray that not just for everyone else here, pray that just for myself as well, that I might listen to you and that together we might hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start this morning with the story of a godly man. He's a man that you have probably heard of because he was famous for his love for the Lord. He was known for being generous and taking care of the poor. Behind closed doors, we are told that he fought very hard for personal purity. We know that he took care of his children. He was especially concerned for their spiritual well-being. He was respected in the Christian community. He preached regularly about God's goodness and his faithfulness. But famously, and this is probably why you've heard of him, this man had an enemy, an enemy who hated him. But interestingly, not just hated him, but especially hated the man's faith in the Lord, his commitment to live for godliness, his desire to worship and live for God's glory. And as a result, the enemy did everything within his power to destroy this man's faith. It's hard, though, isn't it, to fight faith directly? How do you do that? 
So the enemy came at the man's faith through his stuff. He destroyed his wealth, robbing him of his security, wiping out his savings. When that didn't work, he went for the man's family. He murdered his sons and his daughters in cold blood in a single day. Still, that didn't work either. So he poisoned the man. It, it didn't poison him enough to kill him. He had no real desire to kill him. He wanted to destroy his faith, remember, not his life. So he gave him enough poison just to make him long for death, like death would be a release. Enough poison to make him miserable, but not to kill him. And all this suffering eventually just destroyed the man's reputation. He went from being a man who was well-liked and well-respected to a man who was pitied and even despised. His, his friends were persuaded, there must be something wrong with this guy. He must be guilty of some kind of hideous sin. And they'd tell him as much. They'd say things to him like, you know, what is it that you've done to deserve all of these terrible things that have been happening to you? Surely you're hiding something from all this. Well, what have you really done? Come on, tell us. But amazingly, the man's faith stood strong. His enemy was eventually defeated. He left him alone, and the man's life was restored. Now, if you have read a Bible, you'll know that that story is the story of Job in the Old Testament. And his enemy is the devil who is doing his best to stop Job worshipping the Lord. But if you jump to our passage this morning, to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 13, it will tell us that every Christian in this room will, to some extent or another, face a battle like Job's. If you're trusting in Christ this morning, if you're one of his people, Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 13 is here to tell you that you have an enemy like Job. An enemy who is ruthlessly committed to destroying your confidence in God's goodness. An enemy who will hold nothing back from trying to ruin your faith in Christ. But still, like Job, this enemy will not be victorious because God has provided for us in the battle. So this morning I have three headings for you. The nature of the battle, the armour for the battle, and the posture for the battle. So let's start with the nature of the battle. If just as we start, you glance back to chapter 4, verse 14, you'll see that, that Paul has already warned the Christians about the dangers of being blown around by different kinds of teaching and ideas. He calls it, in verse 14, the cunning and craftiness of pe people in their deceitful schemes, he says. In other words, Paul's saying, listen, I'm, I'm teaching you the gospel, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the good news of the gospel, and I'm teaching you that in a world where you will hear false ideas other truths, confusing messages. There are, he says, false teachers in the world who have plans for their own glory and who don't give a second thought for God or his people. But here in chapter 6, verse 11, the schemes, same word, of the devil that we now need to watch out for. Why? Well, because of verse 12. Look at chapter 6, verse 12. Our struggle, he says, is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, the authorities against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In other words, what Paul wants you to know, given what he's already said in his book, he wants you to know that the challenge of the Christian life cannot be explained simply in terms of the false teaching in the world around us or our personal battle with temptation or our battle with the hostility of those around us. No, if you're going to understand why the Christian life is so hard, then, says Paul, you have to understand that the Christian life is a fight against the devil and the forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, it's worth thinking some more about what these heavenly realms are. Heavenly realms, if you've been here for our series in the book of Ephesians, first get mentioned in chapter 1, verse 3, and they're here throughout Paul's letter. And if you remember back to when we looked at them, you might remember that the heavenly realms are, in some sense, a description of the location of the unseen spiritual realities that govern our lives and our world. It's the, it's the place where the hosts of heaven are. It's where the devil is. It's where in chapter 2, verse 6, we're told that spiritually, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Now, of course, it... It's wrong to think of it as a, as a place. You could not find this on Google Maps. 
right? It's not a place that we can visit. It's not a place that we can draw or find on a map. It's maybe better to think of it as a dimension, an unseen parallel to ours. Uh, it's probably what is referred to in, in Genesis 1 as the heavens created on the second day, as separated from the earth. That's maybe what's in mind there. It's certainly there in Revelation 21 when the, the heavens come down to earth. The, the invisible becomes visible, united with this world in a way that's never been experienced before. But for us right now, it's a reality that we cannot see but is real, it's where we are spiritually, where Christ is, where there's a great raging battle. Now I know, even as I say that, I know that in London in 2024, if I say to you that the Christian life is lived out in a battle against the forces of evil in another dimension, you think, well, this guy's gone a bit crazy. You've maybe swallowed a few too many conspiracy theories, Steve. You know, you've been watching too much Stranger Things and you've entered to the upside down. Perhaps you've just been smoking too much weed or something. Yeah, you're having some crazy ideas. But let me just ask you to consider, before you think those things about me, let me just ask you to consider that our objections to the heavenly realms might not be so much because we have evidence that they're not real, but rather because actually in our culture today, the idea of the heavenly realms is slightly offensive to us. I want to suggest to you that for you as a, as a 21st century Londoner, the idea that our lives are governed by forces in an unseen reality is really, really offensive to our sense of independence. You know, to believe in the heavenly realms means accepting that I am considerably smaller than I thought I was. That I'm less influential, more vulnerable than I'd like to imagine. I, I have a vested interest in denying the heavenly realms because it just supports my view of myself that I am told over and over and again. But I also want to suggest to you that if you give it a second thought, you will realize that the idea of a raging battle between the forces of evil and a God of goodness in the heavenly realms, that that idea is as real as the seat that you're sitting on right now. Just think about it with me. I think when you think about this world, you have to acknowledge that so much of our lives are clearly not governed by biology or natural processes alone. Just think about some of the good things that we experience in our world. We live in a world, don't we, where people inexplicably lay their lives down for the weak and the vulnerable. It's incredible, it's amazing. You could not explain that if our lives were just subject to forces that we can see or test in a laboratory. The stories that inspire us and move us are not if you would expect us just, the, for the no heavenly realms, if it was just this world and it was just our lives and it was just processes that we could study, then you would expect the stories that we love and that we like to be stories of, of people who are putting themselves first, who are proud, pushing others out of the way to get their own thing. That's not the stories that we like, is it? Those are not the movies that we watch. We watch Iron Man giving his life to save other people. We read stories about those who sacrificially serve. We love the stories of those who stand in harm's way to protect the weak. All of which, if you think about it, is all very otherworldly. It can't be explained. And I suggest to you that it points to the fact that there is a greater good that is real and brilliant and in the heavenly realms. At the same time, though, we also live, don't we, in a world where there is horrific evil. We live in a world where people are sold for sex, where children are abused, where teenagers murder, murder each other, where in some places women are denied an education, innocent people are bombed and held captive. And let me suggest to you again that natural forces, natural forces, just can't explain that level of evil to you at all. There is a jealousy and a hatred in our world that is deeper than biology. There is a wickedness that is not a part of the ordinary processes of nature. Sarah Everard's been in the news again this week, hasn't she? You, you and I, if you, if you live in London today, you have to acknowledge, don't you, that we live in a city where a police officer can take a woman off the street, brutally attack and murder her in a way which is so indescribably cruel 
that in the review of it, they weren't even able to go into the detail of it. Again, this week, we live in a world, don't we, where the Russian state can kill political opponents because of the ideas in their minds. You know, you and I hear that stuff and you almost instinctively say, that's demonic. And that's right, because that's exactly what it is. There is both an evil and a goodness in our world that we are unable to explain and they are at war with one another in the heavenly places. A spiritual dimension that bleeds into our lives and our world all the time. But here, and this is the remarkable thing to get back to Ephesians 6, is that Paul tells us, well, really, this is God speaking to us, isn't it? He tells us that this cosmic battle between good and evil in the heavenly places is seen most intensely now, not in the murder of Sarah Everard's, not in the acts of generosity and kindness of those around us, but you see this battle most seriously in the struggle for the Christian life. That's where you see it. Why? Well, because the devil, like with Job, really hates not just life and people, but most especially hates faith in Jesus Christ, worship of the living God that brings glory to him. And he has sworn to do all that he can to kill any confidence that you or I have in the gospel story, any confidence that we have in the hope of resurrection, in the work of Christ, it's not so much that the devil wants to hurt us physically or relationally. He may well do both of those things, but he will do those not because he's bothered so much about them, but because he wants to destroy your confidence in Jesus Christ. And so rob God of the glory of saving you. Listen, let me say to you this morning, if you're not a Christian, let me tell you that there is a sense in which you don't need to worry about any of this. You don't need to worry about any of this. Not because you live in a safe world, you live in anything but a safe world. I hope you know that. But you don't need to worry about any of this because in a sense, the devil has already defeated you. You're already on his team. I'm not saying that you're a terrible person or that you're worse than anyone else in the room because his team is not the worst people in the world. His team is those who don't have faith in Jesus Christ. And if he can persuade you through whatever means, maybe even the, the means of saying, do you know what, you're so good you don't need Jesus. He's really happy for you to trundle through life thinking that. And even in these moments now, he's at work to try and snatch away the word of the gospel so that you won't listen. Oh, this is for someone else. I'm not interested in this. But if you're a Christian this morning, we need to be super clear on this. You need to be clear, don't you, that the devil has no desire to make you jump, right? He's not, he's not trying to scare you. He's not living under the stairs and jumping out to try and spook you. No, the battle for the Christian life is this confidence that God loves you, that Christ has forgiven you, that you're included in the Lord Jesus and he will take you to glory. You know, so for sure, the devil might take your health away. He might hurt you or your family or damage your relationships. But when he does that, he will also whisper something in your ear like this, won't he? He'll say, God, can't really love you, can he? If that's happening, you must be a terrible Christian. God has abandoned you. Yeah, come on, just, just give up on all this hocus pocus, won't you, for a moment? Uh, just, you know, just abandon that, live life to the full and die happy, won't you? Now, if we listen to Ephesians 6, none of that should surprise us because we're in a battle. Yes, we're in a battle where the outcome is secure, where Christ has won the victory. The Lord Jesus, through the cross, has his foot on the neck of the serpent. Yes, it's a battle where, in Christ, the devil essentially is constantly scoring uh, own goals, isn't he? He brings suffering and temptation and, and struggle and difficulty into our lives and actually finds it grows our faith. It doesn't defeat our faith. He's scoring own goals all the time. But despite that, still we know, don't we? And we must know that the Christian life is a battle. And in battles, people get hurt. Bad things happen. Blood is shed. You just need to know, don't you, as you look down at Ephesians chapter 6, you need to know that Paul is not saying that your Christian life is a pamper party. It's not an all-you-can-eat buffet. It's not a, a gentle stroll in Regent's Park. You know, if Paul said that, you would have the right to expect this morning your Christian life to be easy, for you to walk out of here and everything to be easy. 
for the sun to shine on you, your health to be glorious. You never have another struggle. And then you just arrive on the, on the shores of glory in blazing brilliance and everything's been fine. But that's not what he says, is it? Instead, he says that arrows will be flying, swords will be slashing, bombs will be going off. So expect struggle, expect pain, expect bloodshed, casualties, sleepless nights, wrestling in prayer, expect tears, expect grief, expect loss. Of course, yes, with the joys and delights and assurances and confidences that come from the gospel. But the nature of the Christian life is, is that if we believe in Jesus Christ, we do so in the midst of a cosmic war between the hosts of heaven's armies and the forces of evil, and we are in a battle. Secondly, the armor for the battle. Next week, we're going to slow down and walk our way through the armor as it's presented to us in the chapter. But for now, just notice with me, look down in your Bibles at the, at the way that uh, verse 12 is topped and tailed by verse 11 and 13 with this instructions to put on the full armor of God. Verse 11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 13 says, therefore, put on. It's actually a different word. It's really better translated, take up the full armor of God. I want you to think about it like this for a moment. Imagine with me that you, you win a competition to be taken to the North Pole. Okay, so uh, you've won the competition. You've got your ticket. You're going to the North Pole. So what do you do? Well, you go down to the docks, you get onto the boat, and it's going to take you to the North Pole, and it takes you to the edge of the, of the ice shelf. And there, the, the captain of the ship kind of lowers the gangplank and says, right, listen, I've brought you to the edge of the ice shelf. On you go to the North Pole. You won the competition. Well done. What do you say? Well, you look at him and you look at yourself and you're in your, your trainers and your joggers. You've got a, like a feeler hoodie on that you bought from a charity shop. And you say to him, listen, wait, 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 wait. I can't walk to the North Pole. I'm not dressed like this. I will die. You know, if, if I win a competition for you to take me to the North Pole, I expect you to give me what I need to get from here to there. You know, please give me a, a warmer coat. Like I had no need for that kind of equipment in Kilburn. Right? It didn't get that cold. But right here, right now, I need that equipment if I'm ever going to make it to the North Pole. Now, that's the sense of it here, isn't it? If you're a Christian this morning, God is not taking us to the North Pole. He's taking us to glory. He's taking us to glory. But we are walking to glory through this battle. He's scooped us up in Christ. He's forgiven us of our sin. He's promised us a place in his eternal kingdom beyond this war in the heavenly places. But to get us there, he is going to have to equip us with things that we did not need before we were in the battle. We had no call for them before we were saved because the enemy wasn't out to get us then and he left us alone. What you'll notice next week as we look at the armor in more detail is that it isn't there to save your health or your wealth or even to save your self-esteem. It's there to save your faith. So we find it's about things like truth, righteousness, gospel, peace, faith. The instruction here, though, is to put on the full armor. Notice the repetition of the word full. Take up the full armor. There it is. It's the, it's the full amount. Every bit that you need. It's, it's the boots. It's the shield. It's the sword. It's the helmet. It's everything. Everything that you need. Nothing is held back. Nothing is left to chance. But you do have to put it on. You do have to take it up. It's worth just thinking about that, isn't it? That's Paul's assumption. Notice that being armed with the armor is not automatic. It has to be, he says, taken up and put on, which assumes, doesn't it, that it is possible for you this morning, for me, to struggle in the Christian life because I am grossly underprepared for the battle that the Christian life really is. You know that, don't you? It's possible for us to be struggling because we have not taken up and put on the full armor, leaving ourselves exposed to the devil's schemes. Not because God has not given us what we need, but because we've neglected to take it up. You know, we've not really thought that the belt of truth was a really important item of the Christian get up because we've not really been that careful about what we believe. You know, we've allowed ourselves to listen to the wackos on YouTube teaching anything. He says, knowing that this is going up on YouTube later. 
You know, we've, we've taken the gospel of peace for granted and have assumed that we don't need to take any time to think about that or to, to build on that or to consider it. Let me try and land this in a really specific way. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. It's back a few pages, it's page 1160. It will come up on the slide, but you might want to turn to it as well. Paul here is talking about the need in church to forgive somebody who has done something wrong but has repented of it. He's trying to, he's trying to teach the church how to respond to that urge that they will have when someone's done that to withhold forgiveness and comfort from them. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. He says this, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the, in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. You see this here, Satan, he says, is trying to outwit us. He says that he has schemes. It's a slightly different word in Ephesians 6 and here in uh, 1 Corinthians for schemes, but it's, the, it's a similar idea. It's about Satan has a plan in mind, if you like. He has a way that he thinks, and his plan is to derail the church and overthrow confidence in Jesus. But how is it, how is it that he is doing that? How is it that he's doing that here in 2 Corinthians? What's the answer? It's very ordinary, isn't it? He's doing it by stopping them, forgiving one another. His plan is to plant in us a desire to overwhelm one another with sorrow by refusing to forgive. His plan is to fill the church with bitterness and resentment. That's the devil's scheme. That's how he would derail the church, by making us bitter. Of course, if you come back to Ephesians, that's exactly what Ephesians 4 verse 27 is saying where unresolved anger is giving the devil a foothold. But Paul is armed and ready for this particular scheme of the devil, so he extinguishes the arrow of bitterness by remembering that the church is, lived its life, is living its life in the sight of Christ. He says, I've forgiven in the sight of Christ. The crucified saviour of the repentant, the forgiving servant is there, he says. And so for us, when trouble comes, and trouble will come, won't it? When you or I find ourselves at the butt end of someone's forgiveness, what will come out of us? Bitterness and resentment? Or will we show forgiveness and grace? When poor health comes to you, and it will come to you, when you're tempted as a result to think that God hates you, to be bitter with him, will you be ready for that thought? Will you be armed with an answer? Fully armed? I don't know about you, but I think I'm tempted at times to look down on previous generations of Christians who, who took the Christian life so seriously that they made a point of going to church twice on a Sunday. They had a, a daily quiet time. They attended the church prayer meeting. How legalistic, we perhaps think. And maybe it was at times. I'm sure I've met legalistic Christians. But it could also just be someone who is taking really seriously this need to be armed for the battle. If you're in the army and you see someone polishing their gun, sharpening their bayonet you don't think that this person is a legalist who's taking it all a bit too seriously do you oh this is a person who's getting ready for battle and let me say that that's true for us isn't it we need to take seriously this need to be armed for the battle this battle that you'll be fighting in your christian life let me tell you this too as well you will be fighting it until your very last breath the devil does not give up when you're on your deathbed so let me ask you, have you put on the full armor? Everything you need is here in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but you must take it up. And that involves more than just listening to me on a Sunday morning. You've got to be about this at yourself at home. You've got to be reading and praying and getting set for the fight. It's something you need to help each other with as you spend time in each other's homes, as you share meals together, as you walk along the street. Be prepared. This is something we do together as we meet to pray, as we disciple one another in the truths of God's word. There is armor for the battle, finally the posture for the battle. I wasn't quite sure what heading to use for this last point, but I want to try and show you and capture the balance of the passage. So with whatever ounces of concentration you've got left, come with me and have a look at verse 10, and let's try and capture this balance, this posture. He says in verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
Now, if you want a bit of a grammar lesson, the NIV translation is not super helpful here because there's strong, be strong there. It is an instruction, it is an imperative, but it's a passive one. It's not so much make yourself strong, as we were saying to the children earlier, it is receive strength. So some translations put it, be strengthened. And that's because the word strong really is linked to the word power at the end of the sentence. The point is, be strengthened by receiving in the Lord the strength or the power that he has. Which means, yes, there is a responsibility on us. We need to take up the armor. We're actively and purposefully being strong. But the strength with which we are being strong is not ours, but is God's. It comes from him. It's his armor, his strength, his mighty power. It's the same in verse uh, 11. We are putting on the full armor uh, so that we can, he says. Literally, the the verb is to be able or to be strong enough to take our stand against the devil's schemes. So here's the image. Yes, we are standing strong and firm, but not in our own strength, in the Lord's strength. We are holding our ground. We're not moving. But the equipment with which we do do it is not ours. It's the Lord's. It's ours in union with him. So you ask me, Steve, is God holding me? Is God going to keep me? Can I trust the Lord? Absolutely, says Paul. Absolutely, you can trust him. Yes, his power will be strong enough. Don't worry. The full armor of God can cope with whatever will be thrown at you. God has got this. He will hold you fast, says Paul. Then you say, but will I have to fight? Will it be difficult? Will it be challenging for me? Will it require my energy and my concentration and my attention? Absolutely, says Paul. Absolutely. This is a command from your senior officer, Jesus Christ. Stand firm, soldier, he says. Don't move. Don't give in. Strain every muscle. Keep trusting in Christ. Keep listening to the truth. Keep blocking out the lies. I wonder if as we finish, you could imagine yourself having a conversation with Job before the book of Job starts. So you, you have this imaginary conversation, you know what's going to happen to Job, and you get a chance to speak to him before it all happens. What do you want to say? Well, for sure you want to tell him, listen, Job, this, these next few years, these are going to be tough. Really, really tough. You're never going to pretend to him, are you, that losing his wealth and his children and his friends is going to be nice. You don't want to pretend that. But you do also want him to be ready, don't you? You want him to be ready. You want him to know that he doesn't need to give in. You want him to know that it's all going to be okay. You want him especially to know this, don't you? You want him to know that the loss of all things is not an indication to him that God does not love him. In fact, what you want to impress upon him is that his loss of all things is an indication that God does love him remarkably. Stand firm, Job. What you need to know, Job, is that God won't lose you in the end. You will be safe. Well, listen, this morning, that's exactly what's been happening in our passage, isn't it? Paul, by the Spirit, has come to us to prepare us for the day of evil. Notice that we're told that the day of evil will come. Verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when, not if, when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand firm. I know that some of you are in that evil day already. Your lives are hard. I know that for us as a church, in many ways, we have faced that too. So what are you going to do? Is the answer? Finally, brothers and sisters, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that in your gracious honesty to us, you have not pretended that the Christian life is going to be any easier than it actually is. Thank you for the clear warning of this passage that we are in a battle, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities and the powers of evil in this dark world, against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. Please help us, we pray, to put on the full armor and stand strong. Help us to know that you will hold us fast, 
But even as we know that and as we sing that together in a moment, help us to also strain every muscle, put in all the effort that we might remain strong, stand firm, testifying to the goodness and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.